uh, amazing commitment of the fund to our teachers um, and to the programs here. Um, you are truly, um, your organization, your board, you as executive director are a terrific partner to us in supporting the professional development work that goes on in the system um, and with our teachers. So thank you very much and thanks for being here this evening. Thank you, Dr. McKeely. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here again. Um, this is my third year here introducing our Cavalier Award winners. Um, I will tell you, for those of you who weren't able to make Celebrating Teachers this year, that you're in for a treat. Those of you who made it are in for a, a second treat. <laughs> um, celebrating Teachers is about my favorite day of the year, frankly. Um, Dr. Lupini always does such a great job of introducing our recipients, uh, reading from their packets, uh, their nomination packets, and I just wanted to share with you a few more things that were in their packets because they were really remarkable nominations and they are really remarkable people. So the first uh, person that I'm going to int introduce to is Kathy Fisher Mueller, and she is the eighth grade and eighth grade social studies teacher at Devotion School and also the inclusion specialist. So from her uh, nomination packet, I learned that Devotion School eighth grade students regularly name social studies as their favorite subject and Kathy Fisher Mueller as their favorite teacher. According to colleagues, she is a masterful relationship builder and teacher who is fair, principled, funny, wise, and knowledgeable. She reaches students who read at a fourth grade level and challenges students who write at a college level, marvels a fellow teacher. In her role as inclusion specialist, she advocates for some of Devotion School's most vulnerable students and works with teachers to find ways to engage them in learning. She inspires and teaches all, of, all with whom she comes in contact, students, parents, and fellow educators alike. A fellow teacher describes Kathy Fisher Mueller as the embodiment of the Brookline core value of high achievement for all. And this is a quote. Every conversation with her makes me smarter about inclusion, about learning, about teaching. Her students are valued participants in their learning of history. Most importantly, they learn from Kathy about themselves as learners and citizens. I'm honored to present to you our 2013 Ernest R. Cavalier Award recipient from Devotion School, Kathy Fisher Mueller. I want to thank you all so much for inviting me to speak to you tonight. I want to convey my deep appreciation to Dr. Lupini and to the Brookline Education Foundation. The Brookline Education Foundation continues to show their respect for work, uh, teachers and the work we do, and I thank you for that. I would also like to thank my supportive wife. The whole Fisher Mueller family is deeply invested in and grateful for the public schools of Brookline. I'd like to congratulate John. Uh, it is an honor to share this award with you, and I think I felt like many people did, like I had a new old friend after I heard you speak. I want to thank the entire devotion staff as well. That is just an incredible place to work. I specifically want to thank the 7th and 8th grade team, uh, first for nominating me, and also for just being the most incredible people to work with. I thank them, and I love them. I love being a teacher. I truly love it. And since the time I was five years old, I wanted to be one. I grew up believing that teachers were people to be respected and admired, and that was an idea that was reinforced by my parents as I grew up. There were really only two times uh, in my life that I thought about not being a teacher. The first was in 1980 when I, like the rest of the country, was mesmerized by the Lake Placid Winter Olympics. It was the Olympics of the Miracle on Ice and Eric Hyden, I was 10 years old, and I wanted to be an Olympian. Uh, I like to think of myself as a practical dreamer, and I knew the odds were stacked against me being a speed skater or a hockey player, so I had an idea. I would be the middleman on the three-man bobsledding team. Uh, <laughs> uh, I adore my parents, but I was the last of four kids growing up in New Hampshire, and the truth is I was mostly unsupervised in the late 70s and early 80s. So someone should have probably noticed when I created a treacherous trail of pure ice in my neighbor's backyard. 
I took my two buddies and the radio flyer and we went for our first time trial. The three of us got into our starting positions, ran with all of our might, and dove onto that sled. And I quickly learned two things. First, Amy Forbes had no idea how to steer a steel-bladed radio flyer sled, <laughs> and that the middleman on the three-man bobsled team has absolutely no power. We ended up running into a large pine tree where I chipped my tooth. I still have that chip. Later that evening, with the exposed nerve of my tooth throbbing, I returned to the idea of being a teacher. I got my first teaching job when I was 22. I started working at the brand new high school in our town, Sauhegan High School, as a member of the Coalition of Essential Schools. And our motto in that first year was, we are building a ship while at sea. We had to take chances. We had to take risks. We had to be willing to try things without being certain that we would succeed. And I can't imagine a better place to have started my career. I worked there for 10 years until Jennifer became the deputy superintendent of Brookline and we moved to Boston. I was home for a couple of years with our young daughters when I got a call from John Dempsey, the then principal of the devotion school. He had a struggling seventh grade teacher who would be leaving mid-year and was wondering if I would consider being a long-term sub. Even though my last job was teaching AP US history to juniors and seniors, and this would be for seventh grade, I said, sure, how hard could that be? <laughs> I then entered what would be the most challenging five months of my professional life. I think that the unwritten chapter of Dante's Inferno has a poorly running seventh grade classroom as the last circle of hell. After only a few weeks, I was totally overwhelmed and exhausted. I had a long list of reasons why it wasn't working, but it was not working. So I thought about quitting. I simply won't put it on my resume, it will disappear, I said. That was the second time I thought about being something other than a teacher. Then I remembered something the writer Annie Lamott had said. There are only two prayers. Help me, help me, and thank you, thank you. This was a help me, help me moment. I had to put aside my bruised ego to learn what I did not know. As in my Sauhegan days, I had to be willing to make mistakes in the name of getting better. So I began to reach out. I would reach out to my colleagues. I sought role models. I went in and sat in classrooms. I watched Deb Allen and Bob Miller because kids simply behaved differently in their presence. I asked Dave O'Hara to come to my class, and he did, every day. I experimented, and I remember the things that I believe in about being a teacher. First, I believe strongly in inclusive classrooms. I believe that it is my job as a teacher to create an intellectually rigorous environment that takes into consideration the needs of all of the learners in my care. Secondly, I believe our students are stakeholders and can offer us great insight into how to make our classrooms, our schools, and our communities better. Third, I believe that students, are, excuse me, our adolescents are doing important social and emotional work and they should not be made to feel ashamed for that. And finally, I believe that when things are hard, I need to stop complaining and try harder. And then something happened. I began to see the magic of a 13-year-old. They are intelligent and searching and playful. And in order to challenge them intellectually, we don't have to forget that. In fact, we can use it. A middle schooler will joyfully dance the Charleston or paint like Aaron Douglas or theatrically debate like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Those the first five months at Devotion gave me the invaluable experience of being a first-year teacher again, but this time I knew more. I had the confidence to reach out to my colleagues and the good sense to believe it is good for my students to see me as a learner. There are only two prayers. Eight years ago, I said one of them, help me, help me. And today, with immense gratitude, I get to say thank you. John Andrews. Uh, John is an English teacher at Brookline High School and from his nomination packet. John Andrews is a superstar teacher 
with students who are struggling to write a paragraph, as well as with students who read James Joyce for fun. He is compassionate, intelligent, organized, funny, and committed to educational equity for all. He values true collaboration, and his work and teaching embodies that value. He has served on the Department Hiring Committee, founded the BHS Writing Center, has been senior book captain, I'm not quite sure what that is, John, a student teacher <laughs> liaison, Sunshine Fund Manager, and I am told, Department's Comedian. This is a, a, from a former Cavalier Award recipient who shares an office with John. This is a quote. John Andrews is the pedagogical center of the English department's universe. We turn to him for ideas at department meetings. We count on him to find grounds for compromise in our debates. And we're certain that he will always push us in directions that are good for students. He owns the last word at our meetings because he has earned the last word. Those English teachers can really write. <laughs> I'm honored to present to you our 2013 Ernest R. Cavalier Award winner from Brookline High School, John Andrews. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this moment. It's a lot to take in. I would not be here without the support of my family, my friends, and my colleagues. My supervisors and fellow English teachers, past and present, inspire me and support me and help me out when I'm in need. Thank you, school committee, Superintendent Bill Lapini and Headmaster Deb Holman. Your leadership and caretaking of the Brookline schools makes our best work in the classrooms possible. To Kathy, isn't this intense again? <laughs> Congratulations. Yep. Uh, and finally, thank you, Brookline Education Foundation, for supporting teachers, including me, for so many years. It's a tremendous honor to receive this award. Teaching is the center of my life. Recognition that it goes well is incredibly rewarding. I sometimes feel I become my best self in a classroom, though certainly not today. <laughs> I'm also sure there was no other path for me. Um, I come from a family of teachers. My Aunt Mary taught English for 42 years in Long Island. My cousin is an ELL teacher in New York City. My father taught English in China for 10 years after he retired from the Coast Guard. My sister teaches high school English in Vermont, and I tell all my students that of the two of us, she's the better teacher. Um, teaching, and English teaching in particular, is like some blood disease in my people. <laughs> so because I'm an English teacher, I couldn't tell you if it's a dominant or a recessive <laughs> gene. <laughs> As children, my sister and I played with a deck of cards called Authors. Each number had a different author. The aces were Mark Twain, the queens were Louisa May Alcott. Consequently, I grew up thinking every author wrote four books. Shakespeare, four books. Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, <laughs> Tempest, Julius Caesar. Mark Twain, four books, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, Mysterious Stranger, and The Prince and the Pauper. Uh, we'd play an English teacher and training version of Go Fish. Do you have Tom Sawyer? Go Fish. <laughs> there was no other path. As a teenager, I was drawn to novels about teaching in schools. When I was 15, it was R.F. Delderfield's To Serve Them All My Days, the story of a shell-shocked World War I vet teaching at a British rural private school. Eventually, I gravitated to Up the Down Staircase, a 1965 novel by Bell Kaufman. Rereading it became my August ritual. Uh, you may not know this novel, though its cover proudly states, now a major motion picture starring Sandy Dennis. It's a story of a young teacher in New York City, bureaucratic memos and troubled students challenge her idealism and she wonders if she'll make it through her first year or return for a second. What sustains her is a connection with students and colleagues who help her laugh who comfort her through challenges and who remind her that teaching is a career of small gains over time. It's a silly novel, but it shaped my life. <laughs> I inadvertently lived that book. When I graduated from college with an English degree and a love for Virginia Woolf's novels, I taught math and GED <laughs> preparation <laughs> in New York City. I worked with adults and high school dropouts in housing project basements and residential drug treatment programs. At one job, my room was next to the facility's trash compactor. It started up whenever I tried to explain ratios for some reason. <laughs> After three years of that, I ran away to graduate school. I wanted to teach English, and I needed to learn how to do it. Luckily, I ran to Brown University. It gave me time to reflect and to learn about education. The Coalition of Essential Schools was active there, and I studied with Ted Sizer. I learned about planning backwards and exhibitions and portfolios. 
Smart classmates pushed me to take risks, to think hard, and to laugh. I also met Margaret Metzger and Elon Fisher. Uh, more on both of them later. After graduate school, I went to DC to teach at Bell Multicultural High School, a small public school. I worked there for seven years, initially teaching history, but finally teaching English. Uh, like any new teacher, I was struggling, but two things got me through. First, Margaret Metzger's voice was on permanent loop in my head, reminding me that students needed to be working harder than I was, that for the first seven years, I wasn't expected to know what I was doing, and that I needed to get season tickets to something, anything, to get my head out of school once a month. I quoted her to my peers and to myself when we had tearful new teacher meltdowns. Bell was a challenging place to teach, and after seven years, I was exhausted. I had poured myself into teaching and school restructuring and mentoring and department chairing, and I burned out. Elon and Margaret came to my rescue. They encouraged me to apply for a job at Brookline High School. I was ready. Brookline had been on my radar screen for years. When Margaret described it to us in graduate school, it sounded like education nirvana, <laughs> where great teachers live out eternity teaching masterful <laughs> lessons to eager, engaged students like Sam. This would be a place where I could focus on my classroom and trust other adults to take care of the other aspects that make school successful. <coughs> when I got to Brooklyn High, it felt like heaven. First, they sell sushi in the cafeteria. <laughs> Second, the students arrive at the high school after years of instruction from amazing elementary schools and teachers like Kathy. Uh, and third, I got to share an office with Elon Fisher. Uh, for the last 12 years, Elon and I have shared a little corner on the fourth floor. We support each other through bad days. We share lesson plans. We listen to each other. One of our colleagues started calling us Bert and Ernie. Um, but I think we're more like Statler and Waldorf, those two wisecracking, cranky Muppets up in the balcony. BHS is a school, though, and we have ridiculous moments, too. Senior pranks and frustration about parking, plagiarism, and NCAS schedules sometimes dominate our emails. Though it never reaches up the down staircase levels of silliness, my colleagues keep me laughing and focused. They remind me that sometimes it's just school, and simultaneously, we're doing very important things. Brooklyn High School has been teacher heaven for me. I've grown here. I've also gained weight here, but I don't blame Brookline High for that. I've taken risks and developed curriculum. I've introduced books to our department, taught classes that challenged my knowledge and skills, developed programs like the Writing Center uh, with support from Liz Keene and Mary Birchnell. All my headmasters, Bob Weintraub, John Ritchie, and Deb Holman, have supported me. I've grown as a teacher because of generous community support. Because of the BEF, I was able to attend AP camp a few years ago with Janae Ramos. Daily, I draw on the curriculum and strategies I learned there. The BEF support makes a huge difference for teachers. It nurtures us. Along with the support from other organizations like the Brooklyn PTO, Teachers of Scholars, 21st Century Fund, the BEF grants recharge our hearts. In the end, though, it comes back to the classroom. The heart of any school is what happens in the classroom, and I've been fortunate at Brooklyn. Tucked up in the fourth floor, I've taught over 1,000 students at Brookline High over the last 12 years. They've impressed me with their fortitude and curiosity. They've made me laugh with their humor and occasionally their excuses for not having homework. These yeasty adolescents, as Bob Weintraub used to call them, continually surprise me with what they can do. It's exciting to witness them thinking and learning and to be a part of their growth. Two quick stories out of a possible thousand. My first year at BHS, one of my students came to class without his homework. He explained that his family dog had recently died, and his family spent the whole previous night watching old videos of that dog. He was too upset to do his work. I assured him that was okay, that he could catch up later. However, at the end of the quarter, he earned a B plus in my class, and he really wanted an A minus to improve his college chances. He asked me, the new teacher, if there was any way to make a deal. Could I possibly loan him two percentage points from the next <laughs> quarter to pull that first quarter B plus to an A minus? <laughs> He knew he would be able to work much harder in the next quarter because, as he put it, my other dog isn't even sick. <laughs> <laughs> Once he said that about his dog, we both started laughing. He survived the, I survived the challenge. He took the B plus, and now he's a real estate mogul somewhere in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Second story. This year, I decided not to participate in the annual Day of Dialogue, an event at the high school organized to raise awareness about LGBT issues. In past years, I've been on teacher panels, and last year I gave a speech about being an out gay teacher, but this year I was too tired. I wasn't sure I had anything new or interesting to say on the topic, and my speech last year had been more grumpy than inspirational. The whole day, though, I felt out of sorts, as if I should have participated in some way in this day of dialogue. 
And as I was walking out of the building, a junior I'd never taught came up to me and said, you know that speech you gave last year? It meant a lot to me. Thanks. These stories keep me teaching, silly stories of healthy dogs and great negotiations to surprising connections that don't reveal themselves in the moment, but slowly and gradually over time. In graduate school, Margaret Metzger explained that teaching is about the intersection of the teacher, the content, and the students. And the last day of her class, Margaret told us that in the center of that triangle is love. And I've been able to experience that love at Brookline High. I still have my deck of authors cards, I still have copies of To Serve Them All My Days and Up the Down Staircase on my bookshelf. I still love the work, the content, the students, and the teaching. And today, I'm incredibly proud and honored. Thank you very much. Well, you both represent, uh, and I think John expressed it very well, you, you both represent where it all happens and why it all happens. Uh, the rest of it, uh, we do, but you're, you make it happen, and we thank you so much. You're the best of the best. We have subcommittee reports. Um, I, I neglected to say that Amy Kershaw can't make it this evening. Uh, and I know there's a, a, a long story that uh, uh, Mr. Chang has to tell us about uh, uh, finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we did not have our previously scheduled finance subcommittee meeting on May 13th. Instead, that's been rescheduled for June 3rd. Thank you. Sure, that would be good, Dr. Lupini. Um, so uh, let me let me say a word about the Ways and Means budget, which I believe is in debate now. Maybe possibly this oh, week. They're, they're voting tomorrow. So um, uh, uh, we had an analysis done on on the Ways and Means proposal um, by both Sean Cronin and, and Mike D'Onofrio, and um, and it's it's a bit of a jumbled mess. Um, Local aid, um, Chapter 70 is up slightly. Uh, unrestricted general government aid is down, which means the total money of it, monies available to the town school partnership are down from the House proposal. Um, circuit breaker is up a considerable amount, but many, many other accounts that come directly to the schools, including the kindergarten grant, including um, METCO, are down. Um, so the, the total package there um, is, is down over the House um, budget. Um, we expect that there may be some movement on, on some pieces of that, although we do expect the circuit breaker number to hold. Um, and I guess we'll be getting more information on that soon. There's also some, some information, you may want to say a word about some of the troubling information within the kindergarten grant itself as it applies to our district. Do you want to? Right. I actually um, had uh, contacted the uh, Lisa Marie. Um, Sears. Senator Sears, thank you. Um, Senator Kane's um, aide who does all the education uh, work and asked them to sign on to the amendment. Uh, there were two amendments, one by uh, Senator Chang Diaz and one by Brian Joyce. Is his last name? It's not Brian, though. I don't think. I think that's right. It is Brian? I think that's right. Anyways, uh, one brings the money back up to the House amount to 23 million, which would be good for us. Um, and the other one takes out some language. But what we would really like, I think, for Brookline is the language on the House um, budget. And that language holds us harmless, basically keeps us uh, all, C all CPCs, uh, community partnerships for children, which most people here don't know about, but some do. Um, we were originally part of that, and we got our money through that originally. And in the, in the House language, that would keep us hold us harmless and we would continue to get the amounts of money that we get now. So I told that to Lisa Marie. She said she would try and see what they could do, but she didn't know if there was anything. It will probably go to uh, joint, um, uh, oh, not joint committee, um, yeah, a joint committee between the House and the Senate right. to resolve the differences between them on the bill. And um, 
hopefully, I, my sense is the money will probably go up, I would think. I mean, it's something that every, there's too many communities that benefit from it that it should, it should, and I think quite a few people probably signed on to that bill. Plus there was a Milton School Committee member who was trying to get um, other school committees to, to encourage their uh, legislators to, to work on this. So that's basically the thing that happens. Thanks, I think we're really concerned that uh, in the end, METCO is either going to be cut or level funded, that we won't see the million dollar increase that was built into the House budget. Um, and that will be troubling in that it's been many, many years since we've seen any increase while we've seen a number of reductions um, to METCO funding. Um, I can't hear if you'd like. Uh, so, um, uh, let me just report on where we are on kindergarten. Just seems to fit since we're talking about the kindergarten grant. So, um, you know, I said to senior staff, we, we, we had a retreat the last two days, that um, the problem with prediction models is that they largely assume that human beings will behave the same way from year to year. And, of course, they don't. Um, so what, what, what I'm really referring to in terms of some of the noise in our model right now is we've had some years where we've had large numbers of uh, kindergarten students, let's focus on kindergarten, register during the summer, and other years where it's been minimal. So last year, you'll recall that, that at this time of the year, though you may not recall the specifics of this, we were, we were around 630. And based on our history from this point out, we had a realistic model that said we were going to have 700 kindergartners. We had a, what happened? Because we only ended up only ended up at 666. So what happened? Well, we had a we had a down year in terms of the kindergarten registration during the summer months, the smallest that we've had in the nine years that I've been here. The year before, we were only at 530 at this time of the year on our way to 600. What happened? We had a fairly large summer registration. So. That, that's all my hedge on what I'm about to say to you, which is that we have, today we have 587. We've ticked up quite considerably in the last few weeks. Um, and uh, and I, we actually believe now we're going to go over the 600. Um, it's going to be closer, we believe, depending on how that summer registration behaves. 620 is a realistic number. It is not out of the question that we're still going to end up back in the 650 range. It is, that is not out of the question. That is not entirely off the board. Okay? Um, I do believe, um, uh, we discussed briefly, that um, it does appear that we're going to be adding another section. Um, we have 29 now. It does, it does appear that we're going to be adding that 30th section because, again, students won't register at the schools that we want them to go to. Um, so, uh, so that, that, may, that may happen as well and will happen as soon as we possibly can. But I, but I do believe we're going we're, we're gonna to be slightly north of 600 um, by the time we get through that summer registration in early August, um, if not before. Ms. Chalopsky. Question. Sure. Um, is there any way through the buffering that you were able to, you couldn't you know, avoid this one extra class? Um, well, we haven't added it yet. We haven't added it yet. Okay, great. We have not added an extra class yet, and, and we will, of course, try to manage those numbers. But, um, but no, the one place I'm, I'm, I'm looking at right now, which I'd prefer to, you know, not, not, not talk about specifically, um, is, is well over the 22-ish now, even though we've employed that strategy of, of, of trying to use buffers effectively. Um, and and I, I should say also, we're, we're, we're pushed at other places. Uh, I, I mean, this year's, this year's number is at, uh, winning number is at Piers. Um, whereas we sit here today, we've, we have five sections and 105 students today. So, um, and, and this area, you know, the Lawrence, Lincoln, Pierce area has on many occasions during the last nine years been our summer registration hotbed. So I'm a, I'm a little concerned even about that. Um, but, uh, but, but no, we continue to be able to do that. We do have some flexibility at some places, even associated with this one school where I may be able to make some, some changes because we have a school or two that are very small yet. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we're starting to hit 
sort of the, the ceiling on these on these numbers. So in years past, or one year past, you actually invited some people to go well, to another school, <laughs> uh, suggesting that the numbers were much smaller and that you know. Do you think you might find so that when we that too? so we may, but when we did that, just remember that um, that we did it because we had no space. Right. The schools. The, this would be more of a budgetary issue. It wouldn't be right. space because in the in the two schools in particular where uh, where we may have to look at adding a section, certainly in the one that seems to be rising up now, there's room. There's, there's actually space. Um, so it would be strictly to try to manage the 29 sections. Um, that's a little bit more difficult for us to do, but, 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 but we may end up employing that. I, I will say that I think we're going to blow well past the number where even that strategy would help us. Thank you. Ms. Stone? Um, not that I'm not concerned about the space, but we, we have a very small contingency we do. in our budget. We do. And speaking of blowing past things, I'm just curious whether or not you've done a back of the envelope about how much of this increase we can take without um, exhausting our contingency. Um, w one or two sections would leave us with something, not very much. Um, certainly if we, you know, have some need at the high school in terms of a section here and section there, we would pretty much um, push past what we've identified as a regular ed contingency pretty quickly. And on that high note, Ms. Chalovsky will move to capital improvements, if any. In capital improvements, I mean, <laughs> you see, there are kids who need to have spaces. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of bills to be signed here, and there's one rather large bill from GNR Construction, which is a construction company at Bronco. There's still 50,000 held back for uh, punch list items, and that was gone over at the building commission meeting. I'm not going to bore you with the details. There's still, as with any project, there's always little things that that continue to pop up or that just need to be finished. Same thing is true with Keith. Um, there also were, uh, uh, there's some money held back and there the actual contractor was there to talk about uh, how they were going to finish it uh, at the meeting. I'm going to go through my part and then I'll, I'll let um, both uh, Abby and, and Moscato, uh, Cox and Moscato go through the uh, modulars and the uh, depot project. Um, the UAB envelope um, improvements is, uh, the estimate came in <coughs> at 1.5 million. This, uh, what they will be doing is beginning the project with money they already have, and then once July 1st hits and at town meeting votes it, uh, we will, the, the monies for the rest of the project will be there. Uh, they're going to be doing the chimneys, the smokestacks, the gutters, and it will be a slate roof and copper gutters because it's a historic building and they need to replace and want to replace with light items. I mean, the building is a 1901 building. It's lasted a long time with what it was built with, and I think uh, it would serve future generations well to do the same. Um, and also Ms. Stone on Pierce School. So uh, why don't we start with you, Ms. Stone, and we'll work our way back. Um, unless I am mistaken, mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there is no new news on the Pierce School. We are um, proceeding apace. Yes. Uh, everything seems to be on schedule, and so far, so good. Yeah. They will be starting construction immediately after school begins. It ends. Um, <coughs> OK. First, I think I'll start with the Lyons Modulars. The committee uh, has met about the Lyons Modulars. At this point, we know that we will be adding four modulars. The question is how they will be situated on the site and whether there will be able to be a turnaround for cars coming down the road. Um, there's, it's a, it's a one-way, it is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street, but it's a dead-end street, and currently, um, it can be very difficult where traffic has to turn and so forth. And the, uh, 
Neighbors in particular are very interested in finding a way that cars can go in there and have a way to turn around. Um, the committee has um, asked that, this just came up actually in an email, someone has suggested that if they can lay out where the building would be, it would be very useful to the committee to walk in at this time. So I think things are proceeding um, as we expected them to proceed, and uh, there will be another meeting in a couple of weeks, I don't have it in front of, in front of me. In terms of Keith, final um, negotiations around um, the punch list are being made, and, and um, I think everything is very close to settlement, and we will be completely finished with that project in, where are we sure? Do we have things to say? Right, I think what they're doing is just the landscaping is the, the major right, part. Right, that's, that's what's left. Do you want me to mention the Unified Arts Building? I did not, I think. Oh, you did not. So okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's really all I have. Okay, thank you. Bob? Okay, things are uh, moving along on the Devotion School Building Project. Um, the RFS for Request for Designer Services has been published in the Central Register. Um, today a tour was led at the Devotion School for interested firms and responses are due to the Building Department on May 29th at 2 p.m. Um, the Devotion School Building Committee will be meeting on Thursday, May 30th at 11 a.m. Um, and uh, we will hopefully be holding interviews on July 9th for an architectural firm um, and hope to have a contract with a designer by the end of July. So we're hoping things will go that smoothly. Um, I was just curious how many firms showed up for the walkthrough? Um, it looks like five firms. Um, the other, there's two other pieces of business. Um, one, we, for the Devotion School, um, I'd like to propose the, and to um, add David Pollock, our newest member, as an alternate member to the Devotion School project. Um, we're allowed to do that if we want to, so. <laughs> uh, and I think that David's uh, input would be very good, so. Uh, I'm actually currently on the committee. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there was a reason I knew. I'm on the Devotion School Building Committee uh, in my capacity as a member of the Building Commission, but I've tendered my resignation to the s select board pending finding a suitable replacement. So I'm, I'm actually still on the Building Commission until I'm replaced on that board, but I've been on the Devotion School Building Committee, so I'll, this will allow me to continue with that capacity. So, but they, if you're still on it till somebody comes, are you still then considered the Building Commission member to the... <laughs> we'll figure that out. But either way, I think we'll do the, the alternate, so we'll make sure. I mean, the, the building commission way. will be replacing me on the Devotion yes. School Building Committee with one of the okay. commissioners, and I don't know whether they've discussed whether one of the four remaining serving commissioners wants to take on that role or whether they'll queue up the, the next person. The, 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 the new person, person. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So should we wait on this vote? If he's already on the commission, on the committee as a commission member and we vote him as an alternate, then he'd be having two roles at once. So should we wait until, I think he has two roles. I, I could suggest an amendment to the to the motion, which is at the time he is no longer. Yes. Uh, I think that would be excellent. That would okay. be, thank you, I would accept that friendly amendment. Thank you very so much, I Ms. Charlopsky. <laughs> I moved it was friendly. Yeah. <laughs> so is that we appoint um, <coughs> David Pollock as an alternate member to the Devotion School Building. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it, David. Congratulations. Uh, the second piece that of business that we need to do is appoint a school committee representative to the Devotion School Renovations and Additions MSBA Designer Selection Panel. And I would like to request that I be that member since I've had experience with this uh, Dust group, and but I would also like the two other members of the school committee member. I would like their input, and in addition to being there at the at the actual. Uh, you can 
<laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Just to show force. No. <laughs> Is that a, a, do we need a vote for that, Ms. Chalupa? Uh, yes, we do. Well, I don't okay. know. Is an appointment, do you need a vote? Can I just put you for a little time? Yes. Yes. Ms. Stone. We should probably make a motion and second it, and then I can ask my question. Okay. So I, I understand that you just made that motion, Ms. Stone? Certainly. Happy oh, to make it. thank you very much. And do we have a second? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Stone, you have a comment. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Helen, can you just explain really briefly what the difference is between this, what, what does the selection panel do so that the building committee doesn't do? Yes, it's very different. Um, what happens in the new process with the MSBA is that we put out the request for services. Then when we get them back, the school building committee will discuss it and sort of help us with their preferences. But we have to go to the MSBA and they have a panel of about 10, maybe even more, maybe people and we have three representatives there so it's very important to sort of understand the process of what goes on there and how they listen to us and actually um, on both projects that we've done with them we have gotten the, the firm that we wanted um, but it so first there is a sort of whittling down if there's a need to whittle down the, um, the numbers of people and the, um, the firms that and then there's usually a second meeting with a presentation by those firms. And right after they present, there's a vote to determine who, similar to what our process was before the MSBA. So it works like a committee of seven, but because of the MSBA involvement, they actually have more votes than we They've do. They've got as a this part, right. <laughs> and we've got this a little so, bit. So it, it takes some control away from the town that we used to have. Exactly, it does. However, I must say that they listen us and they listen to our experience with different firms so yes you're absolutely right what you're saying um, but there's a caveat they, they okay. do tend to listen to what no, we I, I would, didn't, wouldn't I you didn't agree to imply that, that, that that wasn't the case they've been that's terrific that's absolutely yeah. been our experience I've, and I've not heard otherwise from any of my colleagues ah, so, I, I, so I, I think that has been their their preference and the people that just to sort of um, amplify a little bit more the people who they have on that committee are architects, contractors, developers. It's not the board that's on that committee. It's it's people who are in the field. So they, they are knowledgeable, uh, which is important. Great. Mr. Pollack? Uh, Ms. Charlepsky, could you clarify? You, you said that hopefully we would be interviewing architects on July 9th. Is, would that be the Devotion School Building Committee that would do preliminary interviews before the whole thing goes to... MSBA? Correct. So the uh, town would have a round of interviewing architects, or would it be no, MSBA no, interviewing? Hold on, hold on. The selection panel is on the 25th. We would need to, and the responses are due on the 29th. There's a month almost between the time, between May 29th when the responses are due and June 25th. In that time, we have a meeting scheduled. Actually, it's really the afternoon of the 25th. Yes, where we will, we will have all the responses and be able to look at them, and I would assume uh, start to... The building commission, I, I think, direct for the question, the building commission, uh, the building committee in each of these projects that we've done to date has not interviewed no. the architects. That's been done at the selection panel. Absolutely. We had that a chance to review the, materials. We reviewed the materials. And a number of us go um, with the three reps right. to provide input to those interviews on it's an open evaluating meeting. those interviews. Um, but but that, that process occurs there. Thank you. Okay, was that clear? So the, sometime between, I mean, depending, we may do it at that meeting. It may be very really But the, the Devo committee won't do interviews. No, correct. Ms. Gatto. Uh, just, just for information, our three reps are generally a selectman, a school committee member, and Mr. Wilson. No, actually the building commission oh, the building members. Well, I can speak, so technically, <laughs> right, as we, as we saw in the, the, this one email, it's a superintendent's a, a recommendation. Here, historically, what we've done is that superintendent's recommendation has been turned over to the building commission. Um, and Tony uh, Quigley and I have been in contact um, regarding his recommendation, um, uh, re regarding the recommendation he will carry on from me to the building commission um, with, with that designated individual. But whatever it is, we need to vote it tonight so that Tony can get back to the MSBA with those names. 
So I think we still have a, a motion and a second, but we haven't taken a vote yet. Um, and as long as everybody remembers what the motion was. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Ms. Scotto, you had something? Yes, I have a number of things, actually. Um, the first thing that I would like to do is um, say something about the um, 21st Century Fund, just something to you. We had a wonderful presentation tonight with the Caverly winners from the um, Brookline Education Foundation. And we in Brookline are very fortunate because we actually have two foundations who are working for our schools. Um, the 21st Century Fund really works for Brookline High School and the programs at Brookline High School. And they have done, over the years, many, many um, have presented and provided funding for the start of many wonderful programs. Um, so I'm very happy to be in this position tonight to move that we accept the funds from the BHS 21st Century Fund for next year. Um, you all have um, a list of what the funds are. There are no significant changes from last year. And um, I do want, would like to move that we accept these funds. Is there, are there questions or discussion? I ju I, we say this every time, but I, it, it, never, it never can be said enough um, how important this relationship is, um, how much the relationship um, with the 21st Century Fund has grown uh, over the last several years, um, and, uh, and how grateful we are um, both for um, the strength of that, the growing strength of that relationship, and also for the um, the seriousness and professionalism that the the fund takes when approaching the needs of the high school and the opportunities for innovation. So, <coughs> Ms. Chalupsky? just a quick question. Um, I'm not sure if we have in the past or not, but is, is can we send a thank you note to the fund? I think that would be nice. We could do that. How that? Okay. That's a good suggestion. Um, yeah, I just, uh, Ms. Cotto, I just wanted to say there are actually three foundations that uh, support the schools. Uh, the Brookline Community oh, Brookline. Foundation also does to some extent. It's not their sole uh, interest, but uh, I need to say that for a variety of reasons. Well, Sugar, absolutely Thank you. right. <laughs> yes, yes. And our schools are also supported by the PTA. So right. We have, um, we are very Right. Did we take a vote? Okay. So. Uh, no, we didn't. Oh, we didn't. <laughs> we, we moved and seconded. Okay. <coughs> All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. Great. Anything else on curriculum? Oh, yes. Kind of? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, report out on our curriculum meeting on May 14th, where uh, Chris Soft Brown came to the meeting and presented the performing arts learning expectations for K-8. Um, it was a very informative meeting, and uh, Chris has done wonderful things with his department in coming up with these expectations. Someone said, Jennifer Fisher Mueller said that he had uh, taken the program from chaos to complexity. <laughs> and I think that the learning expectations really speak to that. Um, they are, it's quite a, which I had in front of me a second ago, quite a lengthy document where the uh, expectations are divided up into a number of different areas, singing, performing, um, connecting, many different things. And there are, there are expectations, not necessarily at all grade levels, but at the grade levels where they're appropriate. So you can now go to this document and you can look in any area and see exactly what students will be doing at any given time. During the meeting, we also spent a good bit of time looking at the offerings, and this was just an informational talk from our point of view, to see what was actually done in the K-8. to quite an impressive program. Um, we also spent some time talking about the conservatory program at six, seven, and eight, 
where students have choices between band, chorus, and orchestra, and um, in some cases, music production when they get into seventh and eighth grade. I think that this is a program that we should be very, very proud of and that the uh, Performing Arts Department has produced, or the Performing Arts, Chris and, and the people who work with him have really produced a document that I think is an excellent one. Great. So I have another point. Proceed, Ms. Cotto. Um, and it's just to, just to say that we will be meeting again on June 4th at 1030, and we will be looking at the transition to the frameworks, the, the new state frameworks, and how that has had an impact on decline, and looking at the changes in the math alignment. Is it uh, to the new state frameworks or the yes. Common Core or no, both? The, the new state frameworks, the state has taken the Common Core frameworks okay. and um, put them into their frameworks. So the answer to your question is yes, it's the state frameworks and yes, it's the Common Core as well. Great. Any questions for Ms. Gatto? No additional votes, Ms. Cotto? All set. Thank you very much. Weird government relations, Ms. Stone? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, most of what's been going on in government relations was discussed when we did the Finance Committee report. Um, I did want to just ask one additional question about um, the Conference Committee is appointed after the Senate votes uh, the budget, right? So we'd have no, we don't know yet who's likely to be on the conference committee? No. Okay. Um, so that's the only... They have to get a budget by July. They're supposed to get a budget by July 1st. Right. But there is there is another opportunity when we find out who's on the, the conference committee, if there if there is anyone on it um, with whom we have a relationship, that's another opportunity for us to... Weigh in. No, and, weigh in. And I think for us, the language is probably maybe even more important because they're, they're, the Senate language means something that putting the grant into Chapter 70, and it really just, it doesn't make sense if you really want programs to continue to do this, unless you make independent decisions. That's it. Thank you. Um, and that is my report on government relations. Yes, but uh, if you want to continue with negotiations, we'll oh, permit that. My name was there so many times. Yes. Um, <coughs> I, we have, I, we have scheduled, uh, we are in productive conversation with the, um, uh, with the Food Service um, Employees Union and have another uh, conference, uh, another uh, meeting with them scheduled, I believe, for next, for tomorrow. So, but for the week, for tomorrow. Um, and that is all for me. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Lapini. So um, let, me, let me just say that we had a second session uh, today on educator evaluation. Um, the next steps for us are to um, take some of the, uh, the counter proposal that we were given um, and uh, take a look at our original proposal against that counter proposal. Try to, we're we're going to try to create sort of, a, sort of one document out of the show where there are differences and, and and in the vast majority of cases where, where we have agreement. Um, our plan then is to brief the negotiation subcommittee and, and, then, and then go back. My, my sense is that we, we have a 90% a, a plus areas where we agree now. Um, much of that's driven by the, uh, the regulations themselves. Much of it's driven by the, the model contract that was put out. And much of it's just driven by some philosophical agreement on practice. Um, and so we'll have some areas that we'll have to talk about, and we want to spend some time on those with the negotiation subcommittee. But I'm very optimistic that we will be able to come up with some agreement on this um, in a time frame that will allow us an ample opportunity to get our training programs in place and get the implementation plan in place for September. Well, um, let me just add to that, uh, just for the public, that uh, the educator, the primary uh, purpose of educator evaluation is to enable 
our educators to improve their performance through professional development. Uh, and that's really what it's all about. Okay, I wanted to give you I wanted to give you breathing space. Yeah, we're, we're still here. Sorry, sorry. We've we've moved. Um, just so the public is aware, we've moved from negotiations to policy review. Um, subcommittee, um, I, you all got very late, but um, I believe I, you did get it. Um, the uh, we have a draft of a first reading. This is a little bit unusual um, for us because we are not, in fact, doing a first reading of the entire policy. So I just want to explain to the committee. Um, what's going on. This is um, proposed revisions to um, the uh, Public Schools of Brookline student admissions policy. Um, this is about uh, mostly about residency um, requirements for attendance in the public schools. Um, and I, we've been working, the subcommittee's been working with, um, <coughs> with our student attendance officer, Susan Goodman, with um, Ms. McHugh in uh, the superintendent's office and with town council, who are the three people who really um, deal with reports uh, around this policy, around residency and the, uh, the right um, to attend the public schools. Um, the policy was weak in a couple of areas that have um, come to the notice, of, that came to the notice of the administration, and they asked us to take a look at the policy to do a few things. Um, uh, to mostly this is to scrutinize and limit the student population that is not legitimately enrolled in the public schools. Um, we don't know an actual number of, there is no way to know uh, how big that number might be, um, but, uh, but everybody who deals with this policy and deals with the questions that come up around residency um, have uh, told the subcommittee that, um, that it could be uh, anywhere between uh, 20 students a year and 100 students a year. Um, when we are looking at over-enrollment in our schools and uh, space crises, it is vitally important um, that we find ways to, uh, to make sure that the students who are legitimately, uh, families who are legitimately enrolled have the space <laughs> for their children um, and that the town is in fact getting um, the revenues from people who actually live here um, uh, to pay for the schools. So. We are doing this to scrutinize um, the policy for, uh, for any weaknesses, um, and in particular to tighten and clarify um, the proof of residency that happens annually to improve enforcement. So, um, I, so if you look at um, section number one, um, which is the definition of residency, which is unchanged, um, residency is, uh, is defined in the law, not just in this policy, um, as, uh, as the legal residence, um, sorry, that a student must actually, resi actually reside. The term actually reside is in the law. <laughs> we did not make it up. It has meaning. It has meaning for, um, for cases that have been decided. Um, and, uh, the, and it says, um, just for clarification and for the public to understand the policy, the residence of a minor child is ordinarily presumed to be the legal residence of the child's parent or legal guardian having physical custody of the child. A student's actual residence is considered to be the place where he or she lives permanently. Um, so I, again, that, that section is, uh, is not particularly changed. Before, um, what we are really looking to tighten up is in section two, the verification of residency. Um, up until this point, uh, upon initial enrollment, um, everybody, this is a longstanding practice in Brookline, so nothing has changed about initial enrollment. Um, the, uh, the parents or guardians enrolling the child um, provide the district with a signed and notarized um, affidavit of res residency along with proof of residency um, that includes uh, one of several records. We have three categories of records um, that we require for initial proof of residency and uh, upon initial enrollment there has to be proof of uh, one from each of those categories. What we have changed is to um, add the um, affidavit of residency to the annual re-enrollment essentially. This the form 
goes home to all uh, enrolled families. Um, the first week of school, it has many forms in it that parents and guardians fill out. One of them is the reaffirmation of residency in Brookline. Um, this is a form that actually is signed, that when you sign it, it is very clear that you are signing it uh, upon, um, uh, what, what is the, there is a penalty of, um, of perjury. Um, and, uh, and so um, is considered uh, a legal document um, by the courts and if in fact it is signed and we subsequently discover that, um, that it is not true, that there is an actual residence for that student, um, we can uh, both under the law and under this policy um, recover payment um, for any time that that child has spent in the schools when they were not actually residing in Brookline. But by adding that um, uh, in the past for re-enrollment, um, we have not required um, proof of residency in addition to that affidavit. And that is what we have added to this policy. The proof of residency um, in addition to the signing of the affidavit is, um, is, not, uh, is not nearly as uh, difficult as the first enrollment. Um, we are asking that a parent, guardian, or eligible student um, uh, who's a student over the age of 18 um, would provide um, some, some kind of proof from either columns A or B. Um, column A has to do with deeds, uh, mortgage payments, current leases, records of re rental payments, or landlord affidavits. Um, category B is a utility bill, such as oil, gas, electric, cable, or a home telephone bill. And those are the two categories that we would require one, at least one form of um, proof along with the signed affidavit. Um, I, we are encouraged to believe that this will not dramatically increase um, the work that uh, our school secretaries um, do um, to collect this information. They already work very hard. Um, this should not add greatly to what they already do, um, but it will add greatly to our ability to, uh, to really scrutinize the, the re-enrollments. Um, uh, enforcement, again, is we've cleaned up language, but, um, but we have not actually uh, changed anything about enforcement. We have always had the ability to recover, uh, to recover payment. Um, this just articulates uh, what we do if we find out or get a report, which can include reports for anonymous tips, if any report really that comes in, we will investigate. Um, uh, there are penalties, I've already explained those. There are exceptions, uh, students enrolled in the METCO program, students enrolled in the materials fee pro program, any tuition paying students as permitted by law since we don't have um, many tuition paying students anymore um, because that law changed um, and uh, students who um, attend the public schools under the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. Uh, and we cleaned up, again, this was mostly housekeeping. There is a, something called extraordinary circumstances um, which explains uh, a tuition basis, basically gives the superintendent um, uh, the, uh, the ability at his or her discretion to waive um, tuition for students who, um, whose families move out very close to the time when they would have finished school here anyway, essentially. Um, and uh, we have continued to give the superintendent um, that discretion in allowing students to stay, to finish out a school year, um, and, uh, and to waive um, tuition under those circumstances. Um, notification has not changed. There was some discussion of whether or not we should move, um, the, uh, move the actual affidavit of residency um, that is include, has been included in the policy. We've been trying to clean up the policy manual, not to have things like this embedded in the policy manual. The subcommittee discussed the fact that in this case, um, we, really, uh, we really need to have a place where the public can go to understand the policy and also see the forms. And so the subcommittee is actually recommending in this case to leave the form in the policy um, so that we're not sending people um, chasing after a, pol a, a form that um, they really should uh, be able to see in everybody's best interest that they see it. So that is the, as I said, a lot of what we did was cleaning up the policy. We took a, what was a, 
a grid for the categories and turned it into a list, which was easier for everybody to digest. Um, and I, we talked a lot in uh, subcommittee about um, the burden on families. Um, we did remove, actually, re we removed um, one requirement um, for notarized forms um, because we don't feel that getting a, a notary to sign something is a burden that, um, that should be required of families in subsequent years. Um, and we also tightened very slightly. Uh, there is one of the categories of proof is an affidavit from one's landlord um, that you are resident in an apartment and, uh, and, and paying for that residency. Um, I, we have not had a public schools of Brookline form for that uh, affidavit, for that landlord affidavit, and we are going to create one. So again, so that the forms come from us and we're not accepting um, whatever it is that uh, any given landlord might come up with. Um, the one piece that we are not um, moving forward at this time, uh, this first reading, after we hear questions and do any changes, what the subcommittee is recommending, because it's so important to tighten this proof of residency piece, is that we actually vote the change to all but section five, um, uh, part three, um, and uh, that we continue to work on that piece and, and update that at a later date. Uh, that is the piece that um, talks about dwellings intersected by the town line. This is a, um, a very complicated uh, part of our history. There are a significant number of properties, actually, including some multifamily units um, on Beacon Street that are intersected by town lines um, we share with Boston and uh, in a couple of cases with Newton. Um, and uh, changing anything about the right of people in those intersected properties to attend the public schools of Brookline would necessarily have implications for property values. Um, but it is also a very real concern of the town to be um, uh, getting property taxes from the properties that are sending the um, sending kids to the Brookline Public Schools. And so we have a conversation to have with the selectmen about that part of the policy. Um, and uh, we are continuing to look into the numbers um, and uh, try to get a better handle on what the impact of that would be on those property owners and on those families. So more to come on that, but because it is very complicated, um, we didn't want to hold up the policy uh, um, for that conversation. We will be bringing that piece back um, after we have a better understanding of it. Thank you. It's complicated. Are there questions? Ms. Ditkoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just out of curiosity, what the um, the student's actual residence and how that intersects with the point about um, situations of divorce or separation? Can you just explain, like, how does that work? I mean, if a child's parents get divorced, what, or in the process of getting divorced, what happens with this? Um, what happens to the kid? Um, assuming that um, a custodial parent um, remains a Brookline resident. Then it's a it's a non-issue. So I just noticed that there was a clause taken out, and I was wondering if that had to do with that was a clause because it was under tuition waivers. It was a it was an artifact of the history of this policy and did not in fact refer to uh, the general population. It was a specific case that made its way into policy a long time ago for reasons we don't actually understand. And this might um, be. A oh, go on. But the other thing to say is that under any extraordinary circumstances. Um, which is in the policy, the default is to work with the superintendent's office and we are we always, we always work with sure. families um, going through tough transitions. I'm just curious when it says, you know, that, that they, uh, the residence of a minor child is ordinarily presumed to be the legal residence of the child's parent or legal guardian having physical custody of the child, but there are situations where there are shared custody, there are yes. situations where... Shared in in um, shared custody situations, the child may go and, and assuming the parents live in two different districts, the child may go to either. Parents essentially choose. Okay. Thanks. Ms. Chalupski? In the past, <laughs> it used to be that the child needed to sleep in Brookline for a certain amount of days, like four nights was what I had understood to be part of the... In shared custody situations? Yeah. No. I, I, 
that may be the way it was applied here. That's never been my understanding necessarily of the law around shared custody. And that was not in the policy. So yeah, no, I, I noticed it wasn't in the policy. Right. Yeah. So that, that was what my understanding had been, mm -hmm. but it was not in the policy. No, we've heard as, as we've been talking to people about this, uh, um, there have been many uh, different interpretations in the past of, of how, again, one of the reasons we wanted to tighten the, the affidavit and the proof of residency was to um, just to stop having these um, these individual one-off um, conversations about uh, you know unique circumstances um, and different people interpreting the policy differently. Yes, Ms. Ms. Chalupski. I, I don't think it looks like this is for voter registration. I, mean, I don't know what. what does it say? Does it say card? No. We no. Were, we were talking about. Um, but how would you? You go to the town clerk and you ask the town clerk for a card that oh, says right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that came up actually in the discussion. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry to no, that's all right. Did, did one other question, if I might. So I'm a homeowner. I have a deed to my dwelling, and I pay utility bills. But I decide to rent out my house, and I pay continue to pay the utility bills, and the deed is still in my name. What happens then? Um, because those are. And you're suggesting you don't reside here? Correct. Um, well, so those sometimes require some investigation. Those, those, right. generally speaking, we would expect that that bill is sent to your residence, not to that, not continue to be well, sent to you at that address. Let's say I don't have a mortgage, so there's no. But yeah, no, the bill would be sent. Ah, I see. To your <laughs> to your residence, hopefully. <laughs> Which would be a different address than the than the than the address you were renting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss <laughs> Cotto. And this is just a clarification. So, if I am in the case, if I'm in the situation that Helen speaks about, <laughs> I am paying taxes to the town of Brookline, but I am choosing to live in Boston in a rental unit. So even uh, uh, even though I'm paying taxes to Brookline, I cannot send my child to the Brookline schools because the child's residency is out of town. You, you just said that you're a resident of Boston. Right, but I that, have. That, define, I that, that so defines the issue, not where you're paying taxes. Okay, so it isn't the tax. I mean, when we were talking about the line, we were talking about we want people to pay taxes. But so your, your rental to someone else well, is that, paying those taxes. That no, that. May, may I, yeah. Ms. Stone? The, the, because the issue Ms. Stone was talking about earlier is a very complicated issue of, 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 of uh, residents, um, apartment buildings largely that are split, that split right, right. literally 40% in Boston, 60%, what 60%, all of those kinds of issues. They're very, very complicated. We've had a couple of them in the last few years involving the Newton properties that have been particularly vexing. Uh, so they're just very complicated, um, and so I, I think this this way that, that you're looking at proceeding with this is absolutely the right the right way in working um, uh, with the, the um, yeah help me the selectman and and uh, Patrick Ward and his office around around some other kinds of rules that we can look at and see whether they apply in these situations as well. I'm just I just wanted to clarify that it isn't the payment of taxes no. that gains you entrance to no, the school. No, it is not. It's no, residency. No, it's not. It's, it's right. residency. Um, right. The issue with the intersected lines, as we will discuss in much greater detail in the future, um, has to do with, uh, um, with mostly with rental units. And so the Any other questions? There's a very complicated uh, set of discussions and an interesting from my point of view, an interesting juxtaposition between tightening up a policy and making sure that where it, it was clearly necessary, there was flexibility left. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, so we will, uh, we meet next on June 12th, um, and we will um, presumably, uh, if there are no further uh, requests for changes um, or clarifications, we'll move that um, as quickly as possible. Great. Are there any uh, additional liaisons that uh, people would like to talk about? Okay, um, I've, I've uh, 
not going to say anything about B space because I think we need to move on. Uh, there were some interesting things that happened, but I don't think it's essential for for people to know unless you think there's something that happened that. Uh, it's not that anything happened. I think it's always worth um, reminding the public that, that and the committee that um, B Space continues to do its work. Um, there, the um, we talked uh, to a, a consultant, who, a volunteer consultant who lives in Brookline, who's interested in helping us with the actual decision making process. Um, uh, has a very interesting approach that we're gonna. Um, we're gonna. You're gonna devote the next uh, uh, the next uh, meeting to it. Yeah. Have broken into um, into subcommittees to explore a number of the different options um, uh, more closely, and uh, at least speaking for the subcommittee that I'm on, um, I, which is uh, looking at the possibility of a new uh, K through eight elementary school and um, what that would mean for redistricting, um, depending on which what site. There are a number of different sites that we're looking at. We are re we are uh, playing a thought experiment um, with the GIS uh, system um, and drawing new district boundaries um, around each of those pos potential sites and then looking at how uh, or whether um, that new district would allow us to redistrict the other schools in a way that would in fact draw kids um, out uh, to the extent that we need them to be drawn out from each of the other elementary schools. Anyway, I want to just do a, a shout out to uh, Jeff Bernbach at the at the GIS, um, who's just a, a complete wizard and a and a delight to work with, and he makes uh, he makes this investigation um, just it ma makes it possible um, for us to do this. It's it's not something we would ever have been able to do without that technology and without his help. So, and in this case, BATV uh, is uh, is doing all of the meetings so that. Uh, I know there will be a lot of people who want to uh, take a look at the entire video of, of the meeting and uh, find out what we didn't say just now. <coughs> so when is the next meeting? Next, uh, it's a week from tomorrow uh, because uh, the nec next Monday is Memorial. Uh, yeah. Um, and and the, the subcommittee that I'm on, um, which is uh, subject to the open meeting law, is meeting tomorrow morning. So, um, uh, with everyone's permission, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, Ms. Goyne, is there anyone signed up? Morrison, you don't want to speak publicly. You're just here on behalf of the TAB, correct? Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, good. Um, if we move on now, uh, we we would like to uh, spend uh, a few moments um, thanking and and saying goodbye to our student representative. Uh, and um, I'm happy to say that his parents are here tonight. Uh, so I want to recognize both Tom and Sarah Reed uh, and thank you for loaning your son to us and for permitting him to uh, basically continue uh, a tradition in your family of civic service that actually goes back to, um, I think, Mr. Reed's mother, who, if I'm not mistaken, was a school committee person for some time, now several years ago, if I'm correct. Uh, thank you. I was relieved to know that that was true. <laughs> um, in addition, Mr. Reed and I had the, from my point of view at least, the pleasure of working on a very interesting civic activity, I would say three years ago now, Mr. Reed. Uh, it was fascinating from my point of view. And so now, uh, Sam, you've been here and, and uh, you have participated fully. Uh, in the discussions. Uh, you've asked good questions. Uh, you've made some terrific observations. Uh, and you have reported uh, what uh, you have seen going on at the high school and also uh, with your relationship with the headmaster, you have also reported on her behalf, which, which was uh, uh, really good and, and a new 
uh, development for us. So we thank both uh, Ms. Holman and uh, Sam for that. So um, we're going to miss you quite a bit. You may not miss us, but we're going to miss <laughs> you. Um, and <laughs> Bravo. Um, and we know that you're going to go on to do uh, some wonderful things. And uh, in all seriousness, uh, in light of uh, the way our country is situated today, we need uh, new young leadership, uh, particularly in civic affairs. And so we hope you will continue to sustain that family tradition. And uh, we look forward to your straightening out the entire country. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, in view of the uh, enormous amount of time you've spent here and the contributions that you have made, we have a, a small token uh, to share with you. Actually, not share. We're going to give it to you completely. <laughs> I think there's a card inside, and thank you. And so uh, we hope that you will enjoy that. Is that card in your lap, or did you just take it? <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't. So that you don't forget us. Thank you. <laughs> haven't had time for hoodies. You've been spending too much time on civic engagement. <laughs> well, I can finally catch Please. up. Please. I've really appreciated the time that I've been able to, to spend on this committee. I know the time I've spent in this room hasn't necessarily always been the most fascinating hours of my teenage experience. But um, <laughs> overall, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. No, you know, cumulatively, I really have appreciated the time I've spent here. And it really has, as Ms. Holman says, been a really great political education for me. Um, and hopefully, I, I, learned, I learned a lot of things here, so I won't have to screw up too much in the future. Um, when hopefully I, I get to be more involved in, in public service like I hope to do later in my life. And this has been a really great start to what I hope is a, is a career in public service. Um, and I really appreciate uh, everything that I've learned from this, from this committee and from Ms. Holman. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris, for your speech. Dr. Lapini, you want to say anything about the calendar? I'm not there yet. Oh, you're not there My yet? Report oh, I'm terrible. How, how do I always seem to forget that. I, I apologize. Oh, Sam, so. Uh, so you have a copy of the written report. There are only um, three um, items uh, this week. Um, you should, uh, you probably know, I think I forwarded on the announcement that uh, Deb Holman made uh, over the weekend that Anthony Meyer, who's one of our associate deans currently at Brookline High School, um, has been named uh, as dean of students, effective on July 1st. Uh, he will replace Diane Landy, who's retiring at the conclusion of this year. Um, uh, and Anthony's a terrific, a terrific young man. I, De Deb wrote a terrific piece that I've included here in the report about Anthony and his work. I, I, will, I will just say, um, and I had the opportunity to talk with Deb about this in the last few days, that um, uh, I've known Anthony both in some of his work here, um, in some projects he's taken on uh, in working with us at the system level, um, and as a student um, who I had in the ELI um, program, the administrative uh, licensure program, and we are very, very fortunate to have Anthony stepping into this role. He's a terrific young man and will be a great, uh, great leader at, uh, at Brookline High School. So congratulations, Deb, on your decision, which I know was a tough one, but involved a lot of people and took a lot of time and, and was done really well. Thank you. Um, Sabrina Lee, one of our students at the uh, high school, has been uh, named a recipient of uh, a Japan Foundation uh, award through the Japan Foundation, a 2013 JET Memorial Invitation Program for U.S. high school students. This is a very competitive program where uh, only 32 high school students from across the country are given the opportunity to visit Japan. Um, for two weeks. Sabrina will be there from July 6th through the 24th. 
um, on an all-expense-paid trip to learn about the March 11, uh, March 2011 earthquake and tsunami and the recovery efforts um, in the affected area. So congratulations to Sabrina for this, um, uh, as I said, very competitive award. Um, I, I reported to you the last time we were together that Mindy Palo and, and um, Jessica Wender Shubo and I were going to be at a retail leadership forum, which we attended on Friday. Um, we're currently finalizing our plans to offer three sessions of the endorsement course for our core academic teachers, which begin in October 2013. We'll be able to accommodate approximately 90 of the educators, um, of those, those educators in the first year of the offering. Remember that all of our core academic teachers have to complete the endorsement requirements by July 1st, 2016 in order to maintain their license. I want to say one other piece about it, though, and that is that every time I personally am at something on this particular requirement, uh, I, I marvel at how much more complex it, be, it, complex it becomes. So Mindy has quite, Mindy, along with our HR office, has quite a task to because it sounds, the 2016 uh, end date of this sounds complicated enough. Until you mix in the, the fact that a number of these people's licenses are going to come up in the next two years. And when they renew those licenses, they have to have completed this. If they've had ELLs in their class in the last year. So it's a matter of, of looking at a number of different um, factors and making sure that the right people get the right course in the right year. Making it more complicated is the fact that if they took some of the category training, some of you remember that in the past the department had category training for, for teachers. If they took certain categories of the training, they are exempted from certain parts of this course and only have to take certain other parts. So Mindy, um, first of all, has an amazing task on her hands terms of working with our core academic teachers to make sure that they get the course when they need it and it's the right course. And second of all, she's doing an amazing job. Um, this is, I said to Mindy the other day, this speaks to one of her strengths. She has many, but one of her strengths is organization. She's amazing in what she knows about each of our teachers and when their license is up through the work of Jill Kennedy in particular, um, and, and making sure we know who the priorities are in terms of getting into the first cohorts of this course next year. We have some issues to continue to resolve in, um, in, in, the, in the work we're doing with the BEU around the courses and how they'll be offered and tuition reimbursement that might be available for people and all. But we're very well positioned um, to be able to assist our, our core academic teachers and, and it's primarily because of the work of Mindy Pollock. Yes, Ms. Chalupski. Yeah, just one quick question because I keep on forgetting. How many hours is it for the the full course? Um, and people have asked me, so I, and I... So this course is, um, is 45 hours. Um, it's, a, it's a full graduate level course. The department is still doing some work with this course. Um, I should add that 15 hours of it, however, are online. It will... Ne just a couple other factors that I think flesh out a little bit your question or the answer to your question. So it will never be offered during the summer because it requires work in your classroom between sessions. One of the things that they learned in cohort one, which, was, which involves some of the bigger urban areas and offering this course, is that you, you need to allow an adequate period of time in between for people to do the reading and do the work in their classrooms. Some of those districts had, had sessions of the course scheduled too close together and teachers were rushing to be able to do what they needed to do. So we're actually talking about, and this is the predominant model that we're seeing across the Commonwealth where this is being offered. We're talking about a fall offering, a spring offering, and an entire year offering. Thinking that appeals to three different kinds of schedules for people. Um, and we're, and we're going to hope that we, we, can, um, we can get 90 people into the course for next year. Because remember, we're still having trouble making sure that over the three-year period we have enough seats for everyone. Let me complicate one more piece while I'm at it. Um, and that is that there is a course that's required for anyone who supervises someone who teaches 
core academic teachers. So all of our principals and our curriculum coordinators will have to take that course. We're just hearing the beginning pieces now about the availability of that course. And we actually believe now it's going to be available as soon as this fall. And what we're working on now, we believe we have enough people in that category that the department should be scheduling sessions in this district. Mm -hmm. Some other places don't. They're going to send their administrators out. We, we want to try to have it scheduled here. Whether that ends up being in year one or year two, I don't know. But w our goal is to be able to schedule it here. Um, it doesn't intersect well, I will tell you, with the work that we're doing in educator evaluation and all that training and, and those kinds of things for those evaluators and for teachers, et cetera. They're, um, they're, they're not intersecting well right now for us. Okay. Uh, do we have anyone who's finished it? We have no. So to your, to your point, I think what you're asking is, do we have anyone who did all four of the category trainings? Which, which would qualify them for a significantly reduced load? And the answer is no. We have a certain number of people who've done some of the categories, even most of them, but, but, not, but not all of them, I don't believe. Um, there, may, there may be a few, but even those people have to take a certain portion. I believe it's the online component of this course. Um, we have no one, of course, who's gone through this course yet because the department only ran it in those larger districts last year and for teachers in those districts last year. So there were courses run in Springfield and Worcester and Boston and, and those areas. Um, we're one of the larger in terms of percentage of ELL population among the second group of districts that will begin going through next year. Remember that uh, the term core academic teacher applies to fi about five, approximately 500 teachers in Brooklyn. And they must fulfill this requirement. Does the math work to get it done by two, 2000? Um, it does if we get more seats than we get in year one, right? Yeah. Because 90 <laughs> times three is not 500. Exactly. Right. Okay. We'll need more sections. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I was just curious about the nature of the training, whether or not there is anything in this particular training about working with English language learners that translates into uh, professional development in other areas, differentiation, special education, I mean, any of those. Does it, is, it, is it really so specific to English language learners, or, um, or is it, in fact, something that we can see as a larger investment in professional development? So I, Mindy would be much better qualified to answer that because she's actually seen some of the course development work. I can tell you that based on what we heard on Friday, while there are issues with the course yet, they tended to be around these timing issues. But, um, but largely what the department is reporting is that feedback on the content itself is good. Um, and, and the other piece that I've heard is that it does translate to to strategies around differentiation for all. What, what, what I've tended to hear over the last few months is, is that this course teach, uh, works with people around strategies that can be applied with all students. Um, that said, there are issues to work out around amount of homework, it's th th those, ki those kinds of things. I mean, I, I, I actually applaud a course that asks people to go back to their practice and apply things. I, I, I think that's great. Taking things out of the summer means people have less time to devote to them. It, it means they're giving up. I mean, taking a, this course, for example, over the entire year is quite a commitment. Um, and, and that will be difficult for, for, for people. And we're going to try to work with them as best we can around issues like, as I said, tuition reimbursement um, and, and all to, to, make this, um, to make this work and scheduling to, to make this work for teachers over, the, over that period of time. We'll work out some of those issues next year when obviously we'll have our smallest number that we'll have over the three years. Ms. Hitchcock. I shudder to ask how one begins to calculate the cost of implementing something so, like this so in the terms cost of direct cost, but also everyone's time that they are investing. So, so the direct cost is zero. Tuition reimbursement? Well, um, uh, Un unless we in unless we increase, which is one of the things that we've talked about doing, is to increase 
the tuition reimbursement dedicated to this project to to um, incent people to do this in the first year. Yes, but the but but separate from that, the cost of the courses is is zero. We've been lucky enough that a number of our two so far of our teachers have um, applied to teach in the program, and so we have. We don't we don't own them for our work, but we do have more direct access to them. Um, the the indirect I, I can't I can't put a number on it's huge. It's huge in terms of, of the expectations of of people and um, spaces and work that will have to go into this on the part of teachers who are putting in um, a graduate level course. Some of whom are involved in graduate programs, um, who will obviously have to cut down on their load there or suspend some period of time in order to in order to get this work done. I just wonder because when we have our legislative our annual legislative breakfast sometimes we try to um, highlight for our legislators the hidden costs or unfunded mandates that are inherent in some of the legislation that they pass that they often don't see or think about and so if all they know is the cost of this program is zero and yet it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of staff time that is not getting paid on it so right. there's an opportunity cost so um, I don't know if we're gonna remember by the time the next legislative we sh we actually we'll we should because we'll be in the we'll thick be right of it, in the thick of it. We'll be in the thick of remember it. that the that the that the funny little thing about this um, is that this is not a mandate that was created through regulation or legislation this is an agreement agreement that was struck with the Justice Department um, that at least we're told and I thought Paul Toner did a good job of asking a couple questions around what that agreement actually looks like and what was going to happen if there was no agreement but we're told we, we faced the possibility of something much much more severe in terms of that we're told that the Justice Department wanted this done in one year two years not the three. It was a shorter period of time than what Massachusetts um, specified. So, you know, I have to believe that and that it could have been much more onerous on our teachers and on our districts than, than where we ended up. Ms. Scott, did you have a question? I had a comment in uh, reply to Ms. Stone's question, and I think you answered it absolutely correctly about, yes, there was, there is, uh, it certainly does feed into what you normally do in the classroom. And it reminded me of being in China where we were teaching methods to Chinese teachers who were teaching English to their classes. And one of the methods we were using, obviously they were ELL teachers, but it had to do with how you help students understand vocabulary. And you understand vocabulary by acting it out. So if you were, for example, talking about being angry, you might get stab around the room and you, you act it out, you get the student to act out. That's an ELL technique. And, but when we came back, having used that with Chinese teachers, those of us who were talking about it started to use it more with our own classes because in fact, it was an exceedingly effective technique for anybody when you're learning vocabulary. And the other thing is when you're working with ELL students, you are often um, working with very bright students who simply have a limited English vocabulary. That's not necessarily so different from working with very bright students who have some sort of learning disability around language. So you use these same techniques. It's been my experience that whenever you do this kind of professional development, it leaks out into everything else you in fact, any time you take a course, even if it has nothing to do with the subject you teach, that is to say, if I were to take a course, I don't know, in, um, in teaching astronomy, I would learn something about teaching because, in fact, I would be a learner. I would be a learner in that class watching other people teach. So I think it, it I think we, we will, the state will get a lot for the money they spend because our teachers will get a lot out of being in these courses. So, just words from the. Thank you.
Okay, we're completed with the superintendent's report, and now. So, yeah, so um, let, what I'd like to do this evening, um, based on an earlier conversation today, and I'm sorry I didn't get back to you sooner on this. As I said, I was out of the district for the last two days. Is we have um, we have put the um, calendar on our website. We've sent it to parents. Um, I'm, however, going to request a delay until the 6th of June on the formal action on this calendar. There are um, some issues um, that the uh, union president and I would like to um, be able to discuss to make sure that, the, that this is specifically and exactly what we want to recommend. And so therefore, I'm going to ask for a delay on this final action. And I apologize for the last minute nature of this request. I don't even think we have to take a vote on that. So uh, now we come to uh, the competency determination report. And Mr. Mason. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Good evening, everyone. So uh, once again, we have the competency determination report. Um, really wish this, but sometimes I wish there was more interesting news that we could talk about more and debate more and go into. But once again, I only have very good news to share with you tonight about where the high school is in terms of, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Yes. And the news continues across all the areas. Uh, once again, uh, if you look at the column all the way to the right, representing uh, how the various subgroups scored on the ELA exam. Uh, this is, of course, will be the class that's graduating this year. You'll see the I'm sorry, this is the, the class that's currently juniors. You'll see that the results from the 2012 administration of the ELA exam was again outstanding. Subgroups rose almost across the board uh, and a nice closing of the achievement gap. And especially if you remember slides from several years ago, it, it's really been a substantial change in the closing of the achievement gap where now we see African American students at Brookline High School, uh, it, it 91% of them had their proficient and range uh, compared to uh, less than 50% uh, that we saw um, about eight years ago. It's really a continued trend up in ELA. And in math also we see uh, steady improvement and good scores across the board, really excellent results uh, in math in all the subgroups. Science, which in the past has been the area where we've seen the largest gap largest part of the achievement gap. We do see a nice increase in the number here. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done and considerations to be taken, but uh, once again, uh, moving in the right direction here for science. Overall, uh, the numbers of initial failures on first testing for the ELA from, la from the 2000.
please. Now, can you go back to the slide on the seniors for a second? I don't, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I, so um, among those who had sufficient credit to graduate, do you know how many students we're looking at now who, who are in danger of not having enough, having sufficient credit to graduate? One. Normally, there are a number of students who, who achieve their credits during summer. I think the normal summer school graduation can be five or six students. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I don't want to. I don't want to push this, but there are some students who will still graduate in August because they have to pick up certain things that they'll take through summer school. Yeah. Right, so those, tw let me just be clear, make sure I understand. So those 12 to 15 who may graduate in August because they'll take some course or courses in the summer have met these competency determination requirements. Excellent. Thank you. Questions from Mr. Mason? Great job. Oh, Ms. Stone. We can't just let you go, Hal. Sorry. Um, so, and and I forgive me. This is probably this is not something you should be prepared to answer, and I don't expect any data. But I am curious because um, of the. Um, the achievement gap data that you re reported on and the increases in scores uh, in math and English language arts, whether or not we are seeing similar improvements in other standardized tests, SATs, ACTs, does the, does the improvement in the MCAS scores translate into improvement overall? Okay, it would be interesting to know. Thank you. Ms. Chalupski? don't have the answer to, but how do we fare compared to the state average for the, um, actually for all the groups? And the, the difference between our ac um, achievement gap and the state is? <laughs> but to see, since the inception of the MCAS, I mean, some of it will be, you know, we know the test now and, you know, kids do better on tests when it's been known for a while. But, but sort of what the progression has been? Or, or do we have that? We do? I was going to say when, when we have our data manager, we could do that fairly easily. I think easily, that's a good idea. Which <laughs> Great, Hal. Thank you so much. Oh, thank really. You. Good news. It's okay if it's boring. Thank Not to well. worry. Nice job. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Mr. Morris. So, um, Normally, when when we're not on Thursday night, we're taped and shown at some other time. Okay, then. Thank you, Robin. So, uh, let me just say a word before um, Deb Holman, our headmaster. Um, presents on the uh, the attendance procedures. So Deb was fortunate to enough to come into the high school uh, at a time when a great deal of work had gone on around uh, a set of attendance procedures uh, which in their application were not going to work. 
<laughs> they, were, they, were, they were not implementable, I guess, is what I heard the first time I sat in a meeting uh, with her. Pardon? No, 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 no. Th their, their procedures that they had created. And, and <laughs> she and Hal Mason and the deans in particular have spent uh, an inordinate amount of time this year, um, great work this year, working on those to make them implementable, to work with staff around the, what their requirements, what, what, what was needed from them, to work with all of the constituent groups from the school council to the faculty senate to different student organizations to make sure that they had crafted something that's well known and, and certainly could be, could be implemented. And Deb, I just think that you and your staff deserve a, a great deal of credit from, uh, from where you started this work at the beginning of the year um, to, to where you are all, all now. So um, I'm really pleased um, that Deb and Hal are here tonight to, um, to talk about the attendance procedures um, for Brookline High School. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so why a new attendance procedure at BHS? A couple of things that we wanted to talk to you about. Four things, really. Uh, first, the problem and pattern that this change addresses. Second, the philosophy behind it. Uh, three, the process, which Bill just referenced and outlined a bit. And then a couple things about the new procedures themselves, which I know that you have in hand and you've read. Um, so the problem and pattern that we're, we're addressing, that the school was addressing before I got here, was that previous practice, really current practice still for this year, was that there was no limit to the number of absences in a course a student could have, and yet the student could still get credit. So this allowed students many more absences than were necessary or advisable. And as a result, we believe this allowed students to compromise their own learning. Number two, the philosophy of how we're moving forward on this. So in the broadest philosophical sense, the new procedures that we've created assert one of our central beliefs, which, which is a fundamental part of the Brookline High School education, is being present with peers and teachers. Seems obvious. But actually being in a class is a good thing. Um, meaning, two things. Number one, what teachers deliver and the learning experiences created with teacher and student present are really worthwhile, of course. And number two, in this day and age, while modes of teaching are blending in the virtual world and virtual learning spaces, we certainly still value the classic model or mode of students working at the elbow of master teachers and working in collaborative, face-to-face situations with their peers, challenging and provocative discussions with teachers. Those things are valuable in real time in face-to-face face -face situations. So there's the philosophy. Number three, the process. Um, it, it's true, deans and the faculty council have been working for many, many years predating my arrival to create an attendance policy more in line with our academic values and our mission. So a proposal was about to be implemented in September 2012. And in June 2012, Hal Mason, myself, the deans, associate deans, uh, we all decided it was not ready for prime time and that we needed to take an even closer look at it and that we'd be better served if we took it through one more round of work with the new headmaster. Uh, so we broke this news to the faculty. The faculty were disappointed last summer, but okay to take it through one more round of work. Um, I remember one June meeting of three hours with deans and Hal and myself Three hours long, and I was not on the payroll yet, but we, after three hours, got through two pages of the three-page proposed attendance policy. So it was very clear that we, we weren't ready for prime time, and we knew we had to do work on it. So um, the dean's team, which meets weekly with Hal and me, spent many, many hours in the fall refining this, crafting it, crafting the philosophy, the consequences, so that they were um, really equitable and useful. Faculty council. We took it to at least three visits of the faculty council, got their suggestions and edits. Administrative council, at least three meetings workshopping the procedures. Faculty meetings, full faculty meetings, at least two where faculty discussed and offered suggestions and then did a vote in March and approved it, uh, all approved with one abstention. We took it to legislature to have the students in particular talk about what uh, the new policy looked like to them, the students and faculty of legislature asked questions, we made some changes, they approved it in March. Hal and I continued to do wordsmithing and the BHS School Council approved it in March also. So as you can tell, lots of educator hours went into refining this. So the last thing, the new procedures themselves. Um, 
We think the new policy sets reasonable absence limits with built-in warnings in order to preserve the coherence and integrity of a kid's education at DHS. And that translates into numbers, uh, or translated into numbers, the new policy states that a student must be in class at least 85% of the time. Couple key <coughs> changes. Uh, we have set a backstop to the maximum number of absences a student can have per course per year. And that's 21 absences, which sounds like a lot. Whenever I say that to the PTO parents, they gasp. How, how could my child be absent that many times throughout the year? Um, in a few students will hit that backstop, but we needed a backstop because there wasn't one that existed. I think that this supports student choice and planning ahead for a student who has a particular year where they might hit that backstop. And we're going to uh, present this to the students in terms of our great mantra of freedom and responsibility. Um, six unexcused absences per year are allowed, and that triggers, if you hit six, that triggers an end grade, a no credit grade. Um, there's a chance to redeem yourself in number 4C if you have the top procedures in front of you. Uh, another change is that parent guardian notes to excuse an absence, something that we require, must be in to the dean's office within three days. Um, so an, it's an absent unexcused after three days if we don't get that parental note. So that's going to be a culture change with parents. We're going to partner with parents to really get that change in, in procedure out there. Um, so those are the main things. I think that we think that the policy is much more explicit than the one in the past. We think that it's enforceable in the deans and the associate deans and the program coordinators, Hal and I believe that, and therefore we think that it is equitable across the dean, the dean staff. So uh, we're excited about this and happy to take any questions. If I could just clarify one thing, just to add on one thing. We're talking specifically about classroom attendance and not the daily attendance that you would, that you would get in the fall of, of students in places, but specifically about you class. So to even push more on that 21 number, 21 absences in a specific class, remember there are classes only used four days a week. So that would really mean that you're turning to a little more than 25 days of the year that a student might be absent from school if they're in a school that they, they do have that course load. Ms. Shalovsky. it's being uh, recorded. Um, one thing I noticed here um, is you specify certain absences that are result of religious holidays, um, uh, special education. You mentioned the China exchange, but you don't mention any other exchanges or school-sponsored trips. It, was there a reason for that? It, there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, our exchanges to Italy, to Mexico, to France, France we determined, even our sojourn trip to the South Civil right. Rights School, we determined that those absences were missing five, six days, yes. perhaps, um, and that they weren't like the China exchange where it was a semester mm -hmm. major world exchange, where that's a whole different ballpark. But the thinking was, if you're going to choose to do Italy, to do Mexico, to do France, that that's a choice, and so students think about balancing out those absences with the rest of the year, um, because you are going to be missing all the other courses mm -hmm. that are not world language courses, or in the case of the sojourn trip, history courses. Mm -hmm. And those would count toward the 21 or something. Other questions? Ms. Cox? thing for students to think is, well, if I can pass the tests and complete the papers and do the work, why do I actually have to be in the classroom? Um, I wonder if there's any guidance to students about appropriate placement into classes so that they are, that they, the work is challenging to them in, in that class time beyond the participation, which I agree is, is key, um, makes them feel that it's worthwhile question or a good comment and I think our take on that in particular is with the, the piece I said about face-to-face -face, being present with your peers and the teacher working at the elbow of your master teachers yes we learn from our students too um, but that 
that that's a real value. And in a sense, the classroom has recently had the, this kind of, it's been a renewed arena for 21st century skills, which focus on communication and critical thinking that you get through live discussion. You can also do that virtually, but uh, through collaboration, literally face to face, and yes, it can be virtual. Um, but we, we value that, and we think that having the kid in class accelerates and improves, increases what they learn. Sorry, but I haven't had a child at the high school yet, so I, I'm just wondering in terms of advising kids and placing them in classes, is there thought given to that as well? Is there some guidance to that? There, oh, in in that terms of choice of class, <coughs> uh, there, there's a ton of advising that goes, so a ninth grader moving into a 10th grade class gets advice from all of her ninth grade teachers on what will be a stress for her, what would be uh, a good placement for her. The guidance counselors of the department heads do a lot of that, so yes, yeah. Ms. Stone? I'm still working through this business of the trips being counted. Um, looking at the 11 total absences for a semester long course and if you're out on a trip that is sponsored by the school committee um, and you get sick you're going to hit that very very quickly um, and that strikes me as not particularly fair it's not a choice to get sick um, and these are trips that we encourage our students to take as challenges to their comfort level, as challenges to their education. So it's not like choosing to go on a vacation, it's actually choosing to, in some cases, do something that's, um, uh, that's out of their comfort zone. And it seems to me that we don't want to then complicate that choice by saying, but oh, by the way, you better not get sick after you get home. Yeah, they, we thought through this also, and I'm glad how you framed it, though, because it, it's illustrative. Um, the, I was looking here for the piece that says, in some extraordinary situations, we will be able to, you would be able to consult with your dean and the headmaster if you have an appeal. Now, the problem with that is we want that to be extremely rare and for extraordinary circumstances. I think the, the situation that you described, I think it would be extraordinary and extremely rare. Um, and we would be, we could be flexible um, with that. Okay, I'm, I'm t I, I just want to register that I'm still uncomfortable with the, with the message that we're sending about those particular trips. Um, it seems to me that a field trip also sometimes takes kids away from other classes. These are not things that they necessarily have a choice in. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about yeah, this. Yeah, I'm sure, area, I'm sure. About the, the, the five days for the brain right. trip versus having the 21 days right. total. Sure. Which, I mean, you know, even with kids, we had the same conversation with third grade. You know, you see the two by four year kids this year for a big time. And the thought is, well, yeah, for the two young kids, you've already missed five classes. respect your thinking and still disagree, but that's not up to me. <laughs> I'm just, I, I think we are sending a mixed message. I think that if we, I think that if we approve, uh, um, as a school committee member, I feel uncomfortable on the one hand saying, go forth, challenge yourself, go on these trips, but there is uh, potentially a penalty involved um, as if you are choosing to do something that's we see these trips as adding substantially to a child's education. Um, and you're suggesting that it also has the consequence of detracting from that education by coming in conflict with this other philosophy. I think that's, I think it's very difficult to make those both true at the same time. Dr. 
Mr. Rapini. The, the, um, can you, I, I'm sure you looked at this. So on, in, in terms of what we've normally done, the number of trips that sort of fall into this five day or so category, because I don't believe we, I think most of our trips um, are in that range. If they're more than that, they tend to be over a vacation and that's part of the, so it's, so the five days are pretty good. So how, what are these? Do you, do you recall from your conversations and sort of listing these out, what it is we're talking about here? What, Bill, do you mean what are the trips? Yeah, what, so how many of these sort of five day situations do we, do we fall into? Just do, do, you, do you recall on any level from your yeah, conversation? Yeah, France and Cambodia. That's yeah. And even Cambodia is in that five-day range because it's done over a vacation, or at least and partially Mexico, over a vacation. Yeah. And, and the Mexico chip I know is done that way, right? Okay. Sure. Sure. Do you envision? Do you, let me let me ask it this way. Let me ask Ms. Stone's question slightly. So, because you talked about the the uh, the process of looking at these and that being a very small number, do you envision a situation where a student gets to these numbers because of some some um, uh, some absenteeism because of illness that you know is a consecutive days et cetera, where where you wouldn't apply the 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 rule that you talked about the waiver yeah the waiver can't think of one at the moment yeah whereas if that student w had attendance where they where they where they had those five days but they had absences that dotted the map right we're all over the course of the year you might not. Yeah, sure. They have so I'm 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 contrasting a, a lengthy illness coupled with the five that gets you to the number and the waiver process versus those five being applied with what we sometimes see. We you know what we've sometimes seen in absence patterns that are there's not due to an illness. They're they're sort of all over the map. X number per month, X number per week, and whatever. You'd be I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. You'd be less likely to apply right. the waiver in that situation. No, it, it's it's true we would be less likely to. Um, Even knowing that those five were part of that. Yeah, I mean, we've always tried to get as and, many. And my sense is, uh, has been, and again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, you, you two look at this attendance, that the person who gets, who approaches that 21 with that pattern, we aren't generally talking about 21. And, and, and in fact, if they had that kind of attendance pattern, pattern historically, they probably wouldn't be going on this trip to begin with. Yeah. Is that right? Help at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I know I'm not getting you there, but <laughs> I'm trying to help. It's a, it's a. I mean, by I and I end up by saying, well, if all of that is true, then, then why not? Why, list the then trips? why not just list the trips? Got it. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. can I follow up on on that, Rebecca? I, I totally hear that, and I and I like how you also framed. It's we've said that this field trip will add to your education. So if it's the France trip, it's it will add to your world language and your history sensibility and, and so forth. And the reality is, the reality is, the absence detracts from the science and the math and the English education too. Now, do I think that that's okay for the kid to be gone for a week? Yes, absolutely. A world experience is totally worth it. But I think that's part of our thinking in terms of counting that as an absence toward the 21. Um, and let me fill out a little bit more of my comment about choice. I think that. Putting a backstop on uh, absences actually helps kids make choices about the different things that they're going to do. Um, if I go on the France trip, I know that's going to be five absences. I know the grandparent is turning 90 and we're going to, grandma's going to be gone for three days. I know that my sports season or my theater season is going to be really heavy and I'm probably going to get sick and I might get, I might be sick a couple times. What I and then I want to go on two field trips, too, because my history teacher and science teacher take interest in field trips. Uh, to me, it helps a student gauge and take responsibility in a higher way for their attendance in class if they think that there is a backstop there that they have to negotiate. I actually think that that's a good thing. I, I'm not going to quibble. I agree with you on, on, in principle on limits. Um, I, I, I think they're helpful. Um, Clarity is is very helpful. I don't. I'm not quibbling at all with that. Um, I I'm concerned about the message of sending a message that certain things that we invest in as contributing to an, a larger educational experience um, are.
are simultaneously being penalized. Um, and that, to me, is a mixed message that isn't worked out by the explanations. So that's just, I'm, I'm still there. So, so let, me, let me make one. I, I mean, we, we've talked on a number of occasions that there are going to be pieces of this that we're going to come back at the end of year one, at the end of year two, at the end of year three, and we're going to talk about how they're working. And, and I'm certain that there will be changes to this over that time. And, and what we've had pointed out here is one that we probably want to focus on. We probably want to focus on the attendance of those students who go on these trips. We probably want to take a look at whether they're approaching those numbers, near those numbers, the kinds of situations that you're looking at around them, and also the kinds of situations you're looking at in terms of when you are considering waivers. And we want to talk about all those in terms of the evaluation. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Great. Mr. Chang, you, we've solved it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gatto? Ms. Charlovsky first, if she's part of this discussion, I'll wait. Are you part of this discussion, Ms. Charlovsky? <laughs> 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 <It's laughs> I think so. Um, Very good. <laughs> Proceed, please. No, but it's, uh, I'm talking about attendance, but not about right. vacations. Right. I mean, uh, not uh, about school sponsored trips. Um, so, for instance, kids who are in special programs like Bright or had a concussion or something like that where they may be out of class for three weeks usually you know with any of those what happens to that in this policy yeah if you look at number one B, I'm sorry <coughs> so one B students with extended health emergencies hospitalizations may consult with the Dean who may seek headmaster consideration to excuse Perfect. the absences okay we spoke a lot with clinical staff yeah. uh, social workers nurses bright staff about how to manage that we we left it open because there's no consistency, of course, in the student's medical issues, and so we needed to have that flexibility. No, that's great. I mean, on the one hand, you do want to have that because of kids who have school refuse or anything like that. You want that to be there as much as you can for all these kids, but yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, the only point I want to add on to that is that there are also students who have plans that are modify, that modify their day for periods of time, short periods of time, longer periods of time. And of course, if a plan is created that modifies a student's day, then, then that plan exempts them. Right, but that would be a, a student with an IEP as opposed to somebody in Not the necessarily. Right. No? Oh, okay. No, a 504 could 504. do the same thing. Okay. okay. Great. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Chang. Yeah. I actually have, uh, have a question. So what's interesting to me is that as I think about the thought process, right, is that the 21 days have to come up a certain way. And the way in my mind, it comes up is that, okay, you have all these sanctioned trips. Granted, China is the one that's obviously out of the box. And these sanctioned trips and subsequent, you know, issues along health or things like that may prolong the number of days that this person is going to be out. And when you guys came up to 21 days, were you particularly focusing on these trips? Um, you know, students that have gone on these trips and they had used up these certain days. Uh, is that where you came up with 21 days? No, no. No, and historically it has not been a problem. Historically, I think if you look at the history of the Affordable Care Act, we have continued to address the problem, particularly with those students who are excessively out of need. Right. That may be qualified as not being out of need for a prolonged period of time. Okay, thank you. Now, Ms. Scotto. Now, um, I wanted to change the direction a little bit. Um, I want to say how pleased I am with the way you framed this, that this is an attendance policy that supports the values of Brookline High. I worry a lot today in education about people who seem to think that if you can pass the course, you have all the education you need from that particular class. Or we could do it all on computers and that you really wouldn't have to worry about this. And I think back to Socrates. Socrates knew so his been value. To recently, I've been to Greece recently. Greece recently. This is true. <laughs> but, but Greece has been to the school <laughs> Right, Greece has been. But Socrates knew that the value of educating somebody was in the discussion that he had with them, that face-to-face -face discussion where he prodded them along. And I am still old-fashioned enough and old enough to believe <laughs> that the real value that, that teachers have with students is in that kind of face-to-face -face discussion.
profession because you are teaching them not only the subject, but you are teaching them how to interact with other people and how to lead their life. And I think if we can have an attendance policy that supports that value, I for one say hooray. Yeah, I think the, the most old-fashioned and revolutionary part of the talk. <laughs> Sorry, I just leave you with that. Thank you. Ms. Ditkoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As much as I'd love to swing at that pitch, since Ms. Scotto knows I don't agree with her, um, I actually have a, a different question to ask. Um, but that, that's for How disappointing. Um, I do think people actually live their lives partially online and do interact with other people online and do learn online. It is. Yes, it is. But you said you weren't going to swing at that. I know. It's just so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I lied. So, yeah, exactly. It was a bunt. Um, you need an umpire. I actually had a question. To what extent do we have um, students, and this might be one off or it might be not very many at all, but do we have students from other cultures who go back to home countries for extended periods of time during the school year? Do we see that phenomenon? Is it notable, not so much. I'm just l thinking about the internationalization and globalization of our population. So I, I know that the younger grades, it's an issue. Kids disappear for a month um, with their parents back to a home country. Um, and I'm curious. I'm I sorry? I'm just curious if it's a high school phenomenon that you've that witnessed at all. I here, but Cal's got a couple more years than I have. Yeah, I have seen that over here as well. I actually, in, in my teaching, did see that uh, uh, people uh, from high school, uh, parents took their kids away during the winter when they came from southern climes. You saw it too? It's interesting. Yeah, I, w I actually, w uh, oh, uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Chalovsky. I just want to get a word in edgewise finally. But, uh, just a quick question. According, with this policy, if it were to have been in effect for this year, did you look to see how many students would have been affected by this? We did. We, I was looking at some of the data um, earlier. I know we don't have a data analyst. I'm I, not yeah. trying to ask you I, for something. We did. Before he left, we had some data for us last summer and last fall. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to quote to you what the changes were, but they weren't detrimental to students. Um, we, we, have, we have very complete data on last year's numbers. So okay. last year for the year, yes, we would have had, without any warning or without any uh, preparation for what the policy was, we would have had approximately 80% um, of students go back to their country of origin. So it was actually quite a large number. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so it is the same. But it's a, but it's a little bit less. misleading in that, in that people don't have a, it's hard to take a policy that you're going to apply and plop it on a group from a year ago. Yeah. Because they don't, they don't, they need to know the policy. Of course, right, right. of course. So no, I'm aware of that. My, no, I was just. Those numbers will be much smaller. That's my prediction. Right, and right. an important part of this policy is that as these steps come along, as these cue grades, as we have a policy for cue grades, and that warning grade comes along, that triggers a conference with the institution and the students and the parents and students working on this and discussing how much are those students doing well, what is the cultural expression. That has an impact. I think it's a legitimate area. It's hard to say that it's not going to have an impact. I think that's the general message that comes out. What does Q stand for? So I, I m might have missed this in the discussion, and, and maybe I have, this is an even more old-fashioned concept, but it seems to me that uh, students have a responsibility to be in class, uh, particularly if they're very bright, 
to share their talents with the other students who are in that class. Did you, did you talk about that at all, or is that a concept that would, uh, came up? We, we definitely did. So it, picking up on what Barbara was saying too, students and teachers being present together in the classroom, student-to-student -student interaction and sharing, and sharing talents and learning together as well as teacher-to-student interaction. So that's definitely part of the philosophy that we got. Yeah. Okay, good. Have we exhausted the subject, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Thank you. You've been great, you've great been work. very patient with us, and it is great work. Great work and great Thank you. bravo. Thank you for the feedback. Yep. Okay. Is there anyone who has new business? Well, then I think. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay. Not, that's, I, don't disagree, I don't agree with you about that. That's part of a...